and do this more often. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, first order of business, if you have a cell phone, like I do, please turn it off because they do disturb the meeting. Okay. Um, so the format goes the public meeting and then the regular meeting. Um, but before we start, uh, I need to read this and advise people of their rights. Please be advised North Frontenac Council meetings are recorded. By attending a public meeting of council, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded. The chair and or the clerk have the discretion and authority at any time to direct the termination or interruption of the recording. Such direction will only be given in exceptional circumstances where deemed relevant. Circumstances may include instances where the content of the debate is considered misleading, defamatory, or potentially inappropriate to be published. The township shall not be responsible should technical difficulties prevent the recording of any meeting or a portion thereof. Technical issues may include, but are not limited to, the availability of the internet connection, device failure or malfunction, unavailability of social media platforms or power outages. It should be noted that no protection is afforded to council members, employees, or the public for comments made during meetings, which are subsequently challenged in a court of law and are determined to be defamatory. Notice is hereby provided that under the authority of the Municipal Act 2001, in accordance with the Municipal Freedom of Information and Privacy Act, also known as MFIPA, that all information provided for at a public meeting or other public process are considered a public record. Members of council, staff, delegates, and attendees should be mindful of using names of individuals or entities when discussing matters in public. Attendees are advised that they may be subject to legal action if their actions result in inappropriate and or unacceptable behavior or comments. Okay, so the first thing up is the uh, public meeting. Um, this goes first. We are meeting today to consider a bylaw to amend the fees and charges bylaw Schedule A, administration and finance to include fees for science sponsorships located at the scenic route and the historic loop. Agenda. Moved by Councillor Fowler, second by Councillor Harmer. Be it resolved that Council approves the agenda for the public meeting regarding amendments to the fees and charges bylaw dated August 17th, 2023, as circulated. Is there any discussion? In favor? Carry. Amendment to the fees and charges bylaw. Moved by Councillor Hermer, seconded by Councillor Fowler, whereas Council passed Resolution 323-23, receiving for information the Manager of Community Development's Administrative Report entitled Scenic Route and Historic Loop Signage Sponsorship and approving in principle an amendment to the Fees and Charges Bylaw, and that Council will receive comments from the public regarding the proposed amendment, and that Council will consider a bylaw to amend the Fees and Charges Bylaw later in the meeting. Are there any disclosure of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Seeing none, we can now go to public comments. So if there's anybody online that wishes to make comment, please use the raise hand feature found at the bottom of your screen. And anybody in the council chamber wishes to make a comment, please do so. Seeing none online. None in the council chamber. So that's it. So we can do the adjournment now. Moved by Councillor Fowler, seconded by Councillor Hermer. Be it resolved that Council adjourns the public meeting at 5.05 p.m. Any discussion? In favor? Gary. So the next portion is our regular meeting, which we'll call the order at 506. Agenda. 
Moved by Councillor Hermer, seconded by Councillor Hudel, be it resolved that Council approves the agenda dated August 17th, 2023, as circulated. Any comments? In favor? Opposed? Carried. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none, um, we'll go down to the adoption of minutes. Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Hermer. Be it resolved that Council adopts the minutes of a meeting dated July 20th, 2023, as circulated. Any comments? In favor? Carried. Communications, communication section A. Moved by Councillor Hermer, second by Councillor Hudel. Be it resolved that Council receives for information Section A items of the Clerk's Administrative Report entitled Communications of Interest. Comments? In favor? Carried. Communications Section B, action items. Lions Club, uh, Lando Lakes Lions Club and the Santa Claus Parade Float. Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Hermer. Be resolved that Council receives for information a letter dated July 23rd, 2023 from the Alliance Club of Lando Lakes, advising the annual Northbrook Santa Claus Parade will take place on Saturday, November 25th at 5.30 p.m. and inviting the Township of North Frontenac to have a float in the parade and thanking Council for the generous donation to the parade. The Council receives for information a report dated November 22nd, 2019 in Council's Resolution 6420 regarding a similar request. The township provides fire department trucks and equipment for both the Northbrook and North Frontenac Santa Claus parades. And the council approves providing public works trucks and or equipment subject to availability of staff and provided there is an in inclement weather. And that council does not wish to participate in the Santa Claus parade by adding a float at this time. Comments? Roy, the Councilor Hoodle. Um, I'm just wondering why we don't want to participate. Is it a good thing? So we did this in um, probably 2008. We, we, we did the float thing. Um, we had one counselor participate and two staff. We did it again in 2009. We had two staff, Kelly and I, participate. So it just, nobody, people expressed interest at the start, but then when it came time to do it, nobody showed up. Nobody was interested. So based on that history, that's that's why we've made this resolution. However, if you know council are willing to willing and want to do this, it's up to you guys. But again, it, it and we didn't budget either for it. But again, it's up to you. I, I think it would be a good team building activity for the staff and the township. But I mean, I'm just one person. But uh, does Attic Islands have a float? Uh, no, I don't believe the township office has a float. Was in the parade last year and expect to be this year again, but I don't know. Um, and the mayor from Anion Highlands just rode around in one of Anion Highlands trucks. That was it. Like I was out with the Lions Club and we were handing out candy and everything else and so on. And that was good. And then we officially opened the the, the, the uh, process afterwards. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I, I was going to ask the question that Roy um, Councillor Hudel referred to, uh, the question to Corey would be, how much interest is there on staff to do this on a volunteer basis? I personally would probably not volunteer my time. Uh, in the past, I've been asked to put in a float for my business, and I think I did one year, 20 years ago, but it's a lot of work. I have to love doing that sort of thing. So what the question is, do you think there's interest on staff now to do this on a volunteer basis? So I, I haven't had any staff approach me saying they would like to do something like this. So I, I, I don't know, but I haven't asked, but at the same time, we haven't had any approach saying they'd like to. Councilor Good? <clears throat> yes, quite a few years ago, uh, actually Race Bridge, my previous job, we did a float and it was a lot of work, a lot of nights working on it. Mind you, it was uh, quite a difficult float too because we had all, a lot of moving parts on there, slaves and stuff. So it's a lot of work. I wouldn't want to volunteer right now for it myself either. Councilor Hermer? Well, I think staff already votes time to a local parade here. So it, it's something to ask them to do it in an adjacent township. 
Councilor Fowler, you have an opinion? Yeah, I uh, I went to the Santa Claus parade a couple times just to see what it was like. And uh, it was almost a little surrealistic in that you got this parade going through the wilderness from one town to the other. But I, I thought it was kind of neat and unique. Um, I, I like the idea of keeping it in uh, North Frontenac, though. I, 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 I kind of liked it. It was a different, something different, but I, I really liked how it pattern, how it worked out. How's the region? So the parade last year was actually, it was excellent. It is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I think it was probably uh, one of the better ones they've had. Um, I don't necessarily think I would suggest a float either, but your presence there would be appreciated. You could walk around and hand out candy to the kids and smile sweetly at everybody. <laughs> Um, Walk nothing. It's called running. It, it is. The... I was I was running for about forty five minutes with the fire oh, department. Fire truck. No, I was not. I was running, but it you know that's something we could do instead if you had time that day. It's a very very nice event. They did an excellent job last year. I uh, I, I personally think that um, we're investing a lot of money in equipment to there, and I know staff devote their time when they're there during the parade and so on. But it's a lot to get everything ready, um, organization, that's our equipment. And Barry Caladar's fire department is right there and they're heavily involved in it. So I'm I don't think I could vote in favor of a vote. So any further comments before I call a vote? Okay. In favor of the motion. Sarah, can you please do the motion again? Yes. Yeah, so um I'll just read the end of it. Um, and that council receives from the reports and then and that the township provides fire department trucks and equipment for both the Northbrook and North Frontenac Santa Claus parades. And the council approves providing public works trucks and or equipment subject to availability of staff and provided there is an inclement weather. And that council does not wish to participate in the Santa Claus parade by adding a float at this time. In favor of the motion? It's Gary. So we have the administrative reports, uh, zoning by law. Dimitri has a presentation. Okay. Dimitri Kurlovich from the uh, County of Frontenac. Hi. Welcome, Dimitri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is Dimitri. I'm one of the planners at the uh, County of Frontenac. So the application I'm going to speak to you today about is uh, Z0123 um, for Sarah and Nicholas Spruill. This is an application that we had a public meeting on on February 24th, 2023. Um, there were some uh, issues that were raised uh, at that meeting. Um, those issues have since been resolved, and uh, we're bringing this item to back to you now for a decision. So. The purpose of this application is to rezone a 0 0.24 hectare or a 0 0.6 acre lot of record from Hamlet exception zone one, also known as HX1 to Hamlet, just straight Hamlet. Um, in terms of context, this property is the only property that is zoned as HX1 or exception zone one within the Hamlet of Cloyne. Every other property within that Hamlet is zoned, zoned as Hamlet. So um, the owner uh, wants to rezone this land so that their lot would have the exact same permissions uh, for uses and uh, development that uh, all other lots in the Hamlet zone have. I'm clicking, but it's not working. Okay, thank you. I'll just say next slide then, yeah, thanks. Um, so just for uh, historical context of how we got here, uh, the Hamlet zone does not, so the just the straight Hamlet zone, just H, does not permit any accessory uses such as garages um, before a principal use is established and constructed. So in this case, a principal use in a Hamlet would typically be a residential dwelling. Um, this property does have a garage on it, uh, and it does not have a principal use. So it has an accessory use, but not does not have a principal use. 
Uh, the information that we received from the current and previous landowner suggests that the intent of the initial rezoning to take it from H to HX1 was to allow the uh, construction of a garage prior to the construction of a dwelling, but not necessarily to restrict all other uses on the property. The way that the bylaw is now worded, the HX1 zone does not permit any other uses that are typically permitted within the Hamlet zone other than the garage that's there. So the current property owner cannot build a dwelling or anything else that's permitted as of right within the Hamlet zone without requiring a zoning bylaw amendment. So this is why they, they're here today. Um, after reviewing the information that we have received to date uh, and the uh, history of the property from the current and previous landowner uh, and uh, site visits, as well as um, just our own experience with such restrictive zonings, uh, we are not quite sure exactly why the zoned, uh, the, the property is zoned the way it is and why the wording is so restrictive. Typically, such restrictive zoning would uh, be reflective of significant constraints on the property, whether it's um, natural heritage features. So like if it's covered completely by a wetland or something, if there are natural hazards, so significant slopes, if there are nearby livestock facilities, aggregate operation or landfills. Uh, in this case, we haven't been able to find any uh, evidence or anything that suggests why the restriction uh, is the way it is. Um, so perhaps the zoning of the current HX1 um, and the wording of that zoning is um, was, was essentially a mistake that was made when the property was rezoned to allow for this accessory use. So as I mentioned before, the intent of the application is to ensure that the subject property has the same uh, rights as all other uh, Hamlet zoned properties within Cloyne. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a site plan of uh, the hypothetical concept of what is proposed. Now, this does not necessarily reflect what the owners want to do with the property. We needed a site plan to support the application because we, uh, needed to be sure that some development or a residential uh, development envelope can be located on the property. Um, so the applicant uh, has prepared a concept uh, and have drilled a well on the property to show that it can actually support a residential uh, dwelling on it. The concept includes a residential addition as well as a septic bed and a septic tank. Um, I will note, so on the left-hand side, that's the... Um, site plan that was submitted initially uh, with the application that was seen on the February 24th meeting. The uh, site plan on the right was the updated site plan that was received uh, for the purpose of this meeting. And the difference really is some setbacks have been modified. Um, the orientation of the garage <clears throat> and residential addition have been changed slightly. And it now also includes the location of the new well that was uh, recently drilled on the property. This, I will mention that although this uh, site plan is in feet, uh, it, this was verified by the septic approval authority being South Frontenac, and they've concluded that a septic bed and a septic, septic tank can be installed within the location identified on the site plan, um, should one be uh, proposed in the future. If development is proposed in the future, they'll still be, they'll still have to go through the permitting process to demonstrate that uh, it fits within all the param parameters that's uh, under the Ontario Building Code, as well as the Township Zoning Bylaw. Uh, next slide. So on February 24th, um, we had a public meeting. There were eight comments received prior to the public meeting. Uh, and then we had uh, several uh, members of the public speak at the actual public meeting. Uh, the, there were four main concerns that were raised um, at that meeting. Number one and most significant uh, was the historical dumping that was associated on the property and the potential soil contamination. Uh, the storage of the, uh, of the shipping container, um, the regarding yard standards or what the property looks like and the inaccuracy of the site plan essentially saying that it was lacking detail. Uh, six of the eight public comments that we received in writing at the time were in support of the application. Uh, we have received two additional comments um, after the uh, this planning report was published and the agenda was published uh, and they reiterated essentially the same uh, themes that were uh, initially addressed on the February 24th meeting. So next slide. I'm just gonna quickly uh, talk about um, addressing those comments. So the one of the most significant things we needed to investigate was regarding the historical, historical dumping claim. And this is specifically in relation to um, 
contamination of the property and making sure that uh, the water that is derived from the pro that's underneath the property is uh, adequate enough for human consumption. So once we received those claims, we contacted the Ministry of Environment, Con Conservation and Parks, who is typically responsible for um, land contamination and providing municipalities with advice on how to handle these types of matters. Uh, MECP advised that a record, a formal record of site condition was not required because there is no change of use on the property. So it's not going from a commercial or industrial use to a uh, residential use. The garage appears to have always been used for residential purposes or accessory to residential. So there's no actual change of use taking place. Therefore, a formal record of site condition was not required. MECP did recommend a water test to ensure that uh, the water that's um, pulled from the property or the aquifer that's underneath the property um, was potable. This again was something that the MECP stated was probably a good idea, but it, it's not mandated anywhere. Um, so County staff discussed this with the applicant. Following that, we consulted with Malra's engineering and a qualified environmental geo, uh, geoscientist to establish the testing parameters based on the information we received at that public meeting. Uh, Malrose um, essentially told us that um, it would be a good idea to test the water that is will eventually be used for servicing the dwelling um, for the standard subdivision suite or basically uh, the parameters that are typically used for residential dwellings to obtain uh, a, a, an occupancy permit. And they've also, because of the history of the property, requ required some expanded parameters that included semi-volatile organic compounds, and also known as SVOCs, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, uh, polycyclic or aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and metals. Um, the applicant was required to identify the well that they would use for servicing the property. So they decided to drill a new well, because drilling a well is the best way to service. Uh, any type of uh, residential use. And um, they also hired uh, McClellan's water treatment and pumps to uh, conduct a test of that water. Uh, the results were done by an environmental laboratory and they were interpreted by an environmental laboratory, um, which were then reviewed by Malrose Engineering. Uh, the water test yielded ele elevated turbidity, hardness and iron, which is pretty standard across the uh, entire county, quite frankly, um, given the uh, uh, the geology of the area. Uh, no other contaminants uh, such as VOCs, SVOCs, PAHs, or metals were um, detected. Malrose therefore confirmed that the water was potable and safe for human consumption. Uh, next slide, please. There are some other concerns that were brought up. Uh, they, were they were also related to um, the storage and use of trailers and shipping containers. Uh, on the property as well as yard standards. Now, these are important issues. However, they are uh, bylaws and licenses that are passed under a different statute uh, being the Municipal Act, whereas the Zoning Bylaw operates under the Planning Act. We cannot use the Planning Act and the Zoning Bylaw to address the issues associated with trailers, shipping containers, or yard standards. So, um, Although, uh, like I said, although these uh, issues are important, it's not something that we can address through the zoning bylaw process. What we are specifically looking for is, um, can this lot be used for residential purposes um, uh, as outlined by the zoning bylaw and what is regulated by the zoning bylaw itself? Uh, next slide. We circulated this application to the uh, Septic Approval Authority as well as Quinty Conservation Authority ahead of the public meeting on the 24th of uh, February. Uh, the, no, they didn't come to us with any substantial comments. The Septic Approval Authority basically said that um, more detail is gonna be required at the uh, septic application stage, specifically related to setbacks from neighboring wells. But in principle, they said that the location identified for the septic system meets the clearing the clearance distances required by the Ontario Building Code. No major concerns identified. Uh, Quinty Conservation Authority uh, basically said uh, the same thing, no major concerns. They did ident identify a small wetland to the north of the property. Based on aerial imagery and site visit, it looks like it's probably closer to the north property line. Um, and they did say that the applicants must maintain a minimum setback of 15 meters to any future development. Um, the township, I will note that the township zoning bylaw requires a 30 meter setback to development. So if uh, the applicant is unable to meet that 30 meter setback, they will need a minor variance in the future. But um, the 
lot is quite deep. Uh, and um, I think there is possibility that they may actually be able to do a development closer to the street line that does meet those provisions of the zoning bylaw, but we'll have to address that uh, come building permit should one be submitted in the future. Uh, QCA also said that they, uh, the lot itself was not in an intake protection zone or a wellhead protection zone, so there were no uh, clearances required under, under the Clear uh, Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. So all that being said, um, planning staff are of the opinion that um, the application as presented meets the intent of the official plan uh, and the zoning bylaw and all relevant uh, provincial and county policies and statutes. And we therefore recommend that this application be approved uh, specifically to rezone the property from HX1 to H. Um, I'll not take any questions. Thank you. So thank you, Dimitri. Does council have any questions for Dimitri? I'd like to commend you on the report. Uh, it's been a long journey and uh, there's been a number of issues and you've addressed them all. Appreciate it. Okay. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motions carry. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. So now we're down to the uh, integrity commissioner. Moved by Councillor Hedl, second by Councillor Hermer. Be resolved that Council receives for information. Okay. Did I? No. Okay. I didn't think so because I thought Dimitri started. Sorry. Let me go back to that. Yes, we can by all <laughs> means. Moved by Councillor Hermer, second by Councillor Hudel. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the planning report from the county planner regarding application file Z123 for a zoning bylaw amendment, and that Council will consider the zoning bylaw amendment later in the meeting. So let's do that over again and make sure we get it right. Are there any comments in favor of the motion? Carried. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Hermer. Be resolved that Council receives for information the clerk planning manager's administrative report entitled Integrity Commissioner Services. And the Council approves Cunningham, Swan, Cardi, Little, and Bonham LLP, led by Tony Fleming, being appointed as the Integrity Commissioner. And the Council instructs the clerk to contact Ayrds and Burles to, adv to advise them the Township will not be extending the contract after the September 30th, 2023 termination date and that the mayor and clerk will be authorized to execute an agreement with Cunningham, Swan, Cardi, Little, and Bonham for Integrity Commissioner services. And the council instructs the clerk to bring a bylaw to the next council meeting to appoint the Integrity Commissioner effective October 1st, 2023. Are there any comments? This came to the county council. And the one question was, what happens if Cunningham, Swan um, do have a conflict as well? There are there are systems in place in the legal side that allow another firm to come in or within their same firm and ad address it and maintain the confidentiality and keep everything above board. Okay, so in favor of this motion? Carried. Sure, I wrote allowances. Moved by Councillor Hermer, seconded by Councillor Hudel. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Clerk Planning Manager's administrative report entitled Two Shore Road Allowance Applications for Approval in Principle, Sosnovsky and Rogers. And that Council approves in principle the applications to close, stop up, and sell the shore road allowances described below. Part of the shore road allowance lying adjacent to part of Lot 26, Southwest Grange, Geographic Township of Clarendon on the Mississippi River. And part of the shore road allowance lying adjacent to Part 1 and Part Lot 1A. Plan 1115, Geographic Township of Barry on Mazna Lake. Any comments? Councilor Good.
Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Herbert. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Clerk Planning Manager's administrative report entitled Shore Road Allowance Closure and Sale Bylaw, Bell, Stone, Ritaco, Atwood, Unger, and Wickman McDonald. And that as required by bylaw 2023, all that part of the shoreline road allowance lying in front of lot 18 registered plan 1557 geographic township of Barrie being part one and registered plan 13R22895 Big Gull Lake. All that part of the shoreline road allowance lying in front of lot eight registered plan 1419 geographic township of Barrie being part one on registered plan 13R22894 Big Gull Lake. All that part of the shoreline road allowance around Cashawakamack Lake lying in front of lot 250 registered plan 1044 geographic township of Barry being part one on registered plan 13R22903 Cashawakamack Lake. All that part of the shoreline road allows adjoining lot 27 in session five geographic township of Clarendon being part 15 on registered plan 13R6226 on the Mississippi River or Mud Lake be declared as surplus and sold to the adjoining owner. Appraisal of the properties are not necessary as these are shore road allowances and the council will consider a bylaw later in the meeting to stop up, close and sell a portion of the shore road allowances. Any comments? In favor? Motion's carried. Traditional land acknowledgement. Moved by Councillor Hermer, second by Councillor Hudel. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Clerk Planning Manager's administrative report entitled Traditional Land Acknowledgement, and the Council adopts the following land acknowledgement. We begin this gathering by acknowledging and celebrating these traditional lands as a gathering place of the First Peoples and their ancestors who are entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immem immemorable. We do so respecting both the land and the Indigenous people who continue to walk us through this world. Today, the Township of North Frontenac is committed to working with Indigenous peoples and all residents to pursue a united path of reconciliation, and that the land acknowledgement shall be read at the beginning of Council Committee and Task Force meetings and may be used at Township events and gatherings. Any comments? Deputy Mayor. Um, maybe I missed it in here, but... Um... I'm curious as to this, the uh, advice that we got. Um, who was consulted in, in writing this? Can you can you tell me, Corey? I'm going to actually defer that to the clerk, if that's okay, Councilor or Ma Deputy Mayor Inglis. So it's it's been a long process. We started out with a group at the county, um, and then we actually took it to the clerks within the county. So we had the county clerk and the four township clerks. Um, and we worked with uh, Terry, can't think of her last name, from the islands, um, and uh, Kathy McLenn from Central had uh, communicated with Doreen um, Davis. Um, and then we uh, worked together to kind of come up with something that would be, um, would work for all of the county. Um, I guess I was waiting for you to suggest that the, um... Ardoc Algonquins might have been involved in some way. Uh, I'm aware that there's a rift in the process right now between that group and uh, the Algonquins of Ontario, but uh, I think it might be uh, respectful to contact uh, Marie Lapointe, who is the uh, current chief of the Algonquins of Ardoc, uh, the Ardoc Algonquin group, and perhaps seek comments from her? Not necessarily against that, but when the county and the townships put all this together, they did do uh, a, a broad search. And you'll notice in this acknowledgement, there are no individual native groups mentioned. Okay, so the idea is to keep it fairly general, then to include everybody rather than trying to, you know, it's, there's so many people involved, and so many different opinions. So it was, it was took a long time to get this far. So the idea was to keep it general and all encompassing. Yeah, I'm aware that this is this can be a really sensitive topic um, among some groups. I'm not suggesting there be wording changes, but simply that contact be made with another local group just out of respect. That's fine. What does the rest of the council think? Councillor Yeah, I have to agree with Deputy Mayor. I mean, we consult with First Nations on about everything, and we haven't consulted on this. I think that's probably. I'm, a I'm not sure that we haven't. Okay. Well, we haven't been told we have. Wait, well, I don't know. Do you remember, Fred, what they told us? 
Okay. Because I know they've, they've listed a whole bunch, including the Métis and the Algonquins and everything. Okay, so there's a, there's a number. But well, Tara mentioned Tara mentioned during Davis. Yes, that's which is one, one group. <clears throat> yes. I'm just suggesting there is another local group. Yes. Can we do that, Corey? Okay. We could defer it, and uh, we could um, consult with them, and then uh, bring it back to the next meeting if you'd like. Okay, what's the rest of the feelings of the rest of the council? Council good? Okay, so the motion is we just, we we just defer the resolutions until we've contacted the, Ardoc, is it Ardoc Algonquins? Yeah, I'm not sure, is it the Algonquins of Ardoc? Is that the official name? I tried to reach out to them when, uh, when I was running for our election it just is what it is. I'm not suggesting it'd be easy to reach. <laughs> I know. They have a lot of things in their plate. Okay, so in favor of deferring? Carrie, do you have to read that motion or is it good? It wasn't Carrie that was deferred. Okay. It was a whole motion and I made a note to contact. Okay. That will bring back an additional report. Councillor Fowler. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at um, one of the subtitles uh, uh, that come with, our, come with our package, and it's um, regarding the Rito purchase number 27 one quarter. And in that document, there's a, a lot of different uh, Indian tribes mentioned, and, uh, you know, there's quite a few there. So I'd just take that into consideration. Uh, I just, you know, I think I think the work's been done, but just in case it hasn't been, it is you know we haven't had one up up, up until now, so another month or two isn't going to hurt. Let's let's get it right. Okay. Um, the next one, next item on the agenda is the blue box material uh, stream and material recovery. Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Hermer, be resolved that Council receives for information the Public Works Manager's administrative report entitled Changes to the Blue Box Material Stream and the Material Recovery Facility, and that Council supports the transition to two streams for blue box items and, and accessing an alternate material recovery facility, and that changes to the blue box recycling program shall be communicated to residents, and that the Public Works Manager is authorized to sign the 2023 annual agreement with the material recovery facility. Any comments? Councillor Good. Yeah, it looks to me it's uh, on paper. It just looks like it's a good good move for us. Uh, my concerns is that we've already gotten everybody organized to on the the, uh, the uh, original plan. Is this going to change much on for as far as the future goes? Like, are we going to be keeping this going or? Like I just read that you said that uh, it looks like maybe all of Ontario is going to go this way. Is that right? Yeah, it's we've wanted to make changes for some time for, for products like glass that we've struggled to manage and we've been paying significantly per ton if we ship it. Um, but I think along the lines of your concern, we didn't want to be changing and changing and changing because you get people set up and used to four streams and sorting. Uh, so we've held off on those changes, but this, there's lots of reasons this looks like the time to do it. And one of the biggest reasons we're working towards our transition in 2025, and we'll be dealing with circular materials and they've indicated their preference is a two stream system. So I think we're, in addition to the other benefits, we're positioning ourselves for that transition ahead of time. Deputy Mayor. Um, Darwin, I'm aware that there's another company in Napanee called Manco Recycling. Um, are are you? Uh, how did you make a choice between Manco and East 360s? They're they're Councillor Ingalls, they're Deputy Mayor. They're actually the same company. It was Manco, and now it's 360s. So. Uh, and my follow up question is: um, How confident are you that the plastic that goes out in a bin with mixed in with the cans? does not end up in landfill. Do you, do you know what happens to this stuff? Uh, yeah, we uh, we attended that site a few years ago and and I couldn't make it recently, but Public Works Admin Assistant and the Waste Recycling Lead Hand attend. 
they sort the products right there on site. So they have a, in the upper level of their facility, uh, a production line. Uh, some of it's automatic, some of it's manual. The, the metal comes out automatically, uh, but it's it's sort of there. It doesn't it doesn't leave there commingled. It's just that they're sorting there on site. Yeah, I'm aware so, that they, they produce compressed bundles of, of plastic, but what happens next? I guess I'm as confident in them handling it right as I am any other material recycling facility. We we really don't track it, follow it. It's yeah, my my fear in that process is that it goes to Toronto uh, in a big truck, uh, and and then from there it goes to a landfill near London. Uh, we just don't know. We just don't. We don't know. I guess we're relying on on you know each of them running an appropriate business. As a, as a township producing a lot of plastic waste, I, I would just like us to, at the very least, be aware of the downstream um, consequences of the stuff we send out, if if that's possible. Well, we can we can ask you know them to confirm what they do with it, but but you know really not auditing their operation. Our information would be appreciated, Darwin. Councilor Good. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, we can find out to get the information, but we have no control of after it leaves our municipality. Uh, the way I'm looking at this, it's it could go to any place, and uh, I could give you an example, but it's a long story. But of what I've seen when I was in the states, so but I think Darwin's done a good job on this report and everything. So, like I said, I, we have no control where it goes after it leaves here. Really. You're, you're right. The only control we have is who we choose to take it from us. And who we want to pay how much money for to do it. Yes, I'm aware that uh, waste is sometimes a uh, revenue and sometimes a cost. And it changes from time to time. Um, Anybody else have any comments? Councillor Fowler. Yes, when uh, I noticed we have the new bins uh, at the Mississippi site, similar to what you have in uh, Lebanon. Um, are you uh, are you making sure that we're not mixing the items in the wrong bins at all, or what happens if that happens? Uh, we are. That's the one role of the attendant. Um, that's a. It's essential that our staff, our sites are staffed, and that's the role of the attendant. Um, and I, I've seen it being there, and I know they, if mistakes happen, they do their best to to take it out, put it in the right bin. Uh, I know that's challenging with these larger bins, but they've been doing it. Um, it's and then and then at the processing end, uh, companies like uh, Zero Three Sixty, uh, for all of those materials, they set a contamination level, so they'll accept a certain amount of contamination. Uh, and beyond those limits, then you start to pay a penalty. So um, that's important to us to avoid that situation in addition to want to recycle materials properly. And as we transition in 2025, I think we're going to see even more stringent uh, limits on contamination. So it'll have to be a high priority for us. Okay, so this has nothing to do with what this is. But the platforms you install at the Mississippi site, can you when you're down there, can you take a look at the deck when, when you walk on it? It's it's safe, but it's deflecting like maybe half an inch or an inch in the middle. And some people, including myself, get a little concerned because it's just it just catches you, like it needs another piece underneath or something, or they've used a lighter metal. Just in your travels. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we'll we'll do that. It I noticed uh 506, I didn't notice it deflecting, but it is a, it's a, an expanded metal that we haven't used before, but. Okay. It might need just a piece underneath. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's more, more of a bother than it is, but it, it will go a long way to ease people's for increase your comfort level of being up on those platforms. Okay. Councilor Hermer. That just gives you more spring to your step, Jerry.
we're going to have to go back to daytime meetings. <laughs> but yes. Okay, so uh, any final comments before we call the vote? Corey? So if we, are you giving us direction for Darwin to look into that or not? We, if we do, we need to add it to the resolution and then we can uh, go from there. I don't want to stir up a debate, but again, I'd like to get some clear direction on that. So if Darwin knows whether we're getting it or not. Thank you. Public works manager is authorized to sign the 23 annual agreement with the material recovery facility. No, I mean about the where it goes after it leaves our sites. We just need, if that's what you just want as a whole, that's great. We just need to, I'd like to add it to the resolution as direction. If not, then uh, we won't add it. Does anybody really like, can we just leave it as open-ended? I don't, I don't mind changing the resolution, but, but let's put it in the resolution. The public works manager is requested to contact the, um, recycling facility and ask generally what happens what's the long-term plan for all the uh, all the recycling material where does it go I used to work for the region of waterloo and they had this massive facility and i still don't know where the stuff went when it went in there so And the motion's been amended to, and that council instructs the public works manager to ask where the materials go once it leaves their facility. Any final comments? In favor? Carried. Okay, fire prevention week. Moved by Councillor Hermer, seconded by Councillor Hudel, be resolved. The council receives for information the Director of Emergency Services Fire Chief's Administrative Report entitled Fire Prevention Week, October 8th to 14th, 2023. And that the North Frontenac Fire Department is joining forces with the not-for-profit National Fire Protection Association to remind and educate local residents about the importance of cooking safety starts with you. Pay attention to fire, to fire prevention. And that council declares October 8th to the 14th, 2023 as Fire Prevention Week. And that council approves of the North Bronick Fire Department's planned events and demonstrations. And that council instructs the Director of Emergency Services Fire Chief to place a copy of the mayoral declaration and an advertisement outlining the events associated with Fire Prevention Week and emphasizing the importance of cooking safety starts with you. Pay attention to fire prevention in the Frontenac News and on the Township's social media and website. Any comments? In favor? Carried. Emergency Services Communication Tower. Moved by Councillor Hudel, second by Councillor Herber. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Director of Emergency Services Fire Chief's Administrative Report entitled Emergency Services Communications Tower. And the Council instructs the Treasurer to take the additional estimated 41000 in expenses for the Communication Tower from the Infrastructure Sustainability Reserve Fund to allow for completion of the project. Comments? Councillor Hudel. Can I just get an explanation of why where this forty-one thousand dollars came from? I know it's over budget, but just break down the detail for me. Yeah, so I kind of tried to lay it out. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it was just not clear in the admin report. So, the project started. It was one hundred eighty thousand dollars at that time. We included the tower, the building. There's like a small building, fencing, generator, and equipment. Um, so that was back in twenty twenty one. In October of 2021, uh, we started working on securing the piece of property that we were going to use. Um, so then that took quite a process um, to get it into uh, like a pin and our ownership and, and some surveying and stuff. So that's part of the overage that we didn't account for uh, when we came to council in February of 2023. Um, at that time, council approved an additional 75,000, which is to add public works and parks and rec. So that was not in the original um, plan. So that was in addition to, and then there was some, uh, at that time we realized that we did not include for hydro. And at that time it was estimated at $25,000. And then there was some extra costs for the communication tower and equipment just due to timing and you know the prices of everything gone up through COVID. So then uh, we finally got the quote uh, from Hydro 
which was quite high. So we tendered out to have the property cleared for the hydro and for someone to install the hydro, um, which was less uh, than Hydro One's estimate, but it was still $45,000. Um, and we originally had planned on 25,000. Um, there was some road work and things we had to do. That was 5,000, that was, or wasn't in the original estimates. And then um, I think when we came back in February, we didn't include the survey work and legal, which was $9,000. So that's where we got to the 41,000. So <clears throat> we're just trying to figure out how we missed hydro insulation on the tower. So the hydro we did actually include in the February report that went to council, but we estimated it at $25,000. And when it came in, uh, the hydro estimate was, I think, 70. When we tendered it, we came to 45. Deputy Mayor. Uh, am I right in seeing that we approved this in the past for $148,000 and it's going to end up being over double that. Is that, have I got the numbers correct on uh, page 85 of the, uh, our page 85? Mm. 289 final cost, total approved budget, 148. Well, 148 is the total spent to date, I'm sorry. That was not the amount approved. Yeah, so, so the original project was 180, that okay. was approved too many on um, 180. Then in February of this year, council approved an additional 109,000. 75,000 of that was to add uh, roads and parks and recs. So they were not in the original plan. So that really is a in addition to. Um, so yeah, we are at uh, about 340,000. So originally it was 180. So if you take off adding parks and rec, um, it was still about 60,000 more than if we stuck with the original plan, but most of that is hydro um, and surveying um, and getting the property prepped that was not planned in the 180. So one interpretation of this is that we approved a project, the scope of that project ballooned somewhat, and now we have this and we're partway in and we can't really say no. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process. <laughs> I'm going to object to that comment. Uh, it's not scope creep. It's just that they missed it up front. Simple as that. You know, we asked, got everything. Oh, yeah, we got everything. Well, they don't do this on a regular basis. If you had uh, a, a division, you wouldn't see a lot of this. But, you know, when yeah. you do it once in 20 years, you know, and it, the reality is we have to do it. You need it. It is what it is. I don't like it, but staff took care of it and got it out as much yeah. as they could. So I'm thinking it is what it is. Yeah, we we tried to manage it in-house and uh, hindsight, we should have probably had got a project manager. Um, also working against us was uh, in the midst of COVID. So costs, you know, for metal and the equipment and things went up as well. So we had a few things that have caused this program to be much higher than we originally anticipated, but we still feel that the end result is some great communication and safety for firefighters and our other staff as well. I just think you have a built-in uh, project manager, technical expert right there. You know, maybe if we do it again, you know, we should make that kind of connection. Anyway, any final comments? In favor? Passed. Pickleball net. Moved by Councillor Hermer, second by Councillor Hudel. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Manager Community Development's administrative report entitled Donation of a Pickleball Net for the Plevna Pickleball Courts. The Council accepts the donation of the pickleball net to be used at the Plevna Pickleball Courts. And the Council instructs the Manager Community Development to contact the Plevna Picklers to thank them for their generous donation. Any comments? In favor? Carry tooth. That cost me twenty bucks. <laughs> <Did it. laughs> I don't want to know how. Two thousand and twenty-three adjustment to property taxes. 
Moved by Councilor Hudel, second by Councilor Hermer. Be it resolved that Council receives the Treasurer's administrative report entitled 2023 Adjustments to Property Taxes. The Council instructs the Treasurer to write off taxes and penalty and interest in the amount of $9,837.54 as authorized for Section 354-2A of the Municipal Act for the following rule numbers. Property 08-0010-51710, residential, write off taxes in the amount of $323.51. Property 06001022400, residential, write off taxes in the amount of $4,993.81. Property 07002031701, residential, write off taxes in the amount of $558.95. Property 06001022110, residential, write off taxes and penalty and interest in the amount of $3,419.80. Property 02001027300, residential write-off taxes in the amount of $449.53. And property 09001007312, residential write-off taxes in the amount of $91.94. Any comments? In favor? Carried. Proposed fees and charges bylaw Schedule A update. Moved by Councillor Hermer, seconded by Councillor Hudel, be it resolved that Council receives for information the Treasurer's administrative report entitled Proposed Fees and Charges Bylaw Schedule A Update. The Council instructs the Clerk to schedule a public meeting to amend the Fees and Charges Bylaw at an upcoming meeting with the following changes to Schedule A. Amend a tax certificate to $40. Amend tax certificates if required within 48 hours to $80. Amend dishonored checks to $35. Add tax sale administration fee of $350. Add extension agreement fee of $200 and add an arrears notice fee of $2 per notice. Any comments? Councillor Hermer. Well, with the cost of living constantly rising, uh, people are faced with hard times. I noticed for a report that the new housing starts uh, dropped drastically in the last month, and that's all due to the cost of operations. I, I, I don't disagree with the, the fees, but I think this is a, the wrong time to impose them. I, I think that it's kind of uh, a situation where we're going to make it more difficult to achieve any development within the municipality. Anyone else? Deputy Mayor. I'm going to complain about the smallest one here. Uh, you get an arrears notice that you forgot to pay part of your bill. You're already being charged interest on that. And just stick another $2 on it. It's just a small insult. I agree. It was, it was going to be two bucks, should be 10. Um, for, what do you get for $2, you know? Uh, to Councillor Hermer's point, I thought along the same lines, you know, why are we doing this? What are we doing with somebody wants to build a new property and so on? But at the same time, why should everyone else that already owns a property be subsidizing someone who wants to build a new property? And you can go in and say, well, they're going to be paying taxes and everything else and so on. But I kind of come down to the conclusion, I don't like it, but I think it is what it is. It's kind of a necessary evil. That's my thought. Anybody else? Else are good? I agree. I don't think the rest of us should be paying for somebody to build a new house extra taxes. Kelly? So I, so I think some of this uh, conversation is going into the next report. So just to be clear, the tax certificates is when somebody is buying a property, generally speaking, and they ask for a tax certificate as part of the sale. Um, so it's the you know new people or possibly the the current owners um, that are asking for the tax certificates. The lawyers are asking for the tax certificates. Um, so this really has nothing. This is more about when properties are being sold. Um, the dishonored checks is just NSF check. Um, the tax sale administration fee is somebody that's already not paying their taxes. Um, so there's significant administration cost uh, to uh, do that process. Um, so that's where that fee is. And the extension agreement is once somebody's already been registered for tax sale, they can enter into an agreement uh, with some sort of a payment plan. Um, so that's where that is. And then the arrears notice is just something we noticed others were doing and just looking for council direction. 
Deputy Mayor. So Kelly, if somebody uh, is facing a sale of their property at a tax sale, do they pay the admin fee plus the extension agreement? Or one is it one or the other? Uh, so they may pay both. So there's administration, there'll be an administration fee as soon as we send it off um, to be registered. Yeah. Um, so they would pay that fee plus they pay any fees that uh, we pay as far as legal um, fees. Yeah. The extension agreement would be once it's registered through the Municipal Act, they can enter into an extension agreement um, and set up like a payment plan with us. Those used to come to council, then it um, was changed and council appointed that I can enter into the extension agreements, but they still have to be registered. Um, so there's some cost to setting up an extension agreement with somebody. Thank you. Is, is anybody in favor of dropping that $2 notice fee that's just i'm sorry that's just that to me it's an insult but it is what it is pardon okay anybody else okay so let's do the let's do the motion with uh the arrears notice fee deleted okay all right in favor carried Treasurer Building Department update. Moved by Councillor Regents, second by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Treasurer's administrative report entitled Building Department Updates. And the Council approves in principle the amendments to the fees and charges bylaw Schedule C with the following. Add $80 non-refundable application fee. Remove $80 non-refundable de deposit. Update construction value to be based on Statistics Canada values. Change the minimum permit fee to be $180 rather than $80. Add a plumbing permit fee of $180 as a flat fee, not subject to an application fee. Add a not ready for inspection surcharge of $180. Construction or alteration of class two, three, four, or five sewage system other than a class A sewage system, $978 fee soup per sewage system. Construction or alteration of a class A sewage system Class A system represents flows greater than 4,500 liters, $1,080 fee per sewage system in per sewage system. Installation or replacement of septic tank only, $770 fee per sewage system. And the council approves in principle the amendments to the fees and charges bylaw schedule Lee with the following. Add an $80 fee for zoning clearance certificate that will need to be obtained prior to submitting a building permit application. And the council approves removing schedule Q. And the council instructs the clerk to schedule a public meeting to amend the fees and charges bylaw at an upcoming meeting. And the council will consider a bylaw later in the meeting to amend the building bylaw. And the council repeals bylaw 421 being a bylaw to appoint septic inspectors effective December 31st, 2023. Any comments, Councillor Hoodle? Just a question of clarity, uh, Don. Um, what is it not ready for inspection? Like, I'm not going to call you until I'm ready for inspection. So we have a few contractors that will call for inspection, and and they're not ready. And we drive and we go up to up the north end, or we go, and it's uh, it's time and time and gas, and gas is getting really expensive in our department. Um, for the fuel of the truck and the prices so what this does is uh, if it, th it's a constant thing from that one person then we can give them a fine of 180 dollars. so hopefully that will fix it for the year and but it's not for every time it's just once in a while and, and it's so that the we'll have negligence calls because we're, we're doing a lot of uh certain people are giving a lot of calls and we're not we're, you know it's costing a lot of money Councillor Hermer, then Councillor Fowler. Well, uh, Kelly, a question for you, I guess. Um, for instance, this uh, minimum fee to for a building permit, how much does it actually cost to do the amend for that? And how much will we be losing at the old fee? Um, so, so the recommendation is to go to an $80 non-refundable admin fee. That $80 would cover just the cost to review um, the, the permit. The $180 min, uh, minimum fee is going to be the cost of the CBO, 
the truck, the gas, and everything once the permit's been issued. Um, so I would say we're still probably not truly covering the, the cost, but um, that's so, but we thought that was a, a fair uh, value. If you if you notice in the report, it showed that our costs are about twenty two thousand, and this was going to give us about twenty twenty and a half thousand. So, you know, you weigh it; it's about equal. So, Councillor Fowler, Councillor Herman took my question. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Mayor, uh, I, I keep thinking of these. Expenses uh, from the point of view of a small business owner, rather than as a member of a bureaucracy that can charge what it wants. Um, I recognize that the, uh, the building department chronically runs at a bit of a loss. Um, if, if this if this were my business, uh, I couldn't just raise prices like this. I couldn't impose a new plumbing fee. Um, for which the customer is going to say, what the hell is going on? Why am I paying this now? Uh, I would try to get more business. I would try to reduce my costs. Um, and I just, I understand what you've done here. You've um, calculated that uh, by imposing these new fees, you can kind of break even at the existing level of permits. But uh, I'm not sure it's it's the best thing to do. I personally don't like it. Once again, if you're if you're a private individual, and it's like, oh my gosh, look at all these fees. But the reality is, if these people, if these applicants don't pay it, then we have to cover our costs from somewhere else, and that then comes back to the general tax levy. And you know, it's sixty-eight or seventy thousand for one percent. So if we're at twenty thousand, there's roughly 033 percent. Comes to Hoodle. How does this compare with the, uh, the other townships, Tom? So. so we're still behind a little bit in our in our price um, compared to where I came from, but uh, we're trying to get there on a slow pace. Um, trying to you know trying to break even is what I'm trying to do. Um, we didn't have plumbing currently in there, so we, you know I was going up to a site three or four times, costing gas in my time, and we didn't even have that in our bylaws. So you know I mean these. Guys are building houses and cottages, six hundred to a million dollar cottages, and and when the other taxpayers are paying for that, so we're just trying to get it's a user based system, the billing code, and and we're trying to do that to to make it fair for everybody. Yeah, it should be. You know, I think it's fair, so that's what yeah. I'm trying to say. Any final comments? Okay, in favor of the motion. Anyone opposed? Carried. Parking bylaw. Moved by Councillor Regent, second by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives from information the Chief Administrative Officer's administrative report entitled to regulate the parking of vehicles, boats, and trailers within the Township of North Frontenac and repeal bylaw 2808 and bylaw 0310. And the council will consider bylaw later in the meeting to repeal bylaws 2808 and bylaw 0310 and adopt a new bylaw to regulate the parking of vehicles, boats, and trailers within the Township of North Frontenac. And the council directs the clerk planning manager to submit the recommended set fines to the reg regional senior justice judge for consideration and authorizes the CAO to amend the recommended set fines if necessary. And the council directs the CAO to apply for the authorized request for information services program and authorizes the CAO to enter into an agreement with the MTO for use of the program. And the costs related to this program shall come from the bylaw contracted services line in the annual budget. Any comments? Councilor Good? <clears throat> How much was coming out of the uh, parks, the uh, campsites as well? This isn't about parks. This is about all of our roads, all of our roads and boat launches and stuff, Councilor Good. Well, that's what I say. It's coming from boat launches and pretty well all these here has part of camping sites on the lakes. So I think some of it should be set aside from the uh, cottages, or the, not cottages, but the uh, 
the uh, charge fees for the home launches. So the ones with with our, within our LUP are, are covered under the under our Crown Land Stewardship Camping bylaw. So this again, this is a separate. It's kind of a separate. Uh, it's a whole separate thing. It's not. It's not. It's not correlated at all. So this is about again our our bylaw for our camping program has. Per, it's got its own parking and its own. Uh, road permit finds all that stuff. So this is about different. This is about all of our roads and all of our boat lots, but take it away from the LUP stuff. You have to you have to separate those two. So this is a little different. Councilor Fowler, yeah, um, I got a question regarding uh, the enforcement of the uh, parking. I guess sir, this is going to be under Part Two of the Provincial Fences Act. Um, or are, are we going to be using a bylaw enforcement officer, or can we maybe make one of our staff uh, be a provincial offenses officer just for this purpose of uh, writing tickets? So at this time, I'm recommending that we use our bylaw enforcement officer for this. Um, if it becomes if it starts to become uh, out of control and we start, we haven't dealt with parking a lot. We've been really lucky that way. But I'm, I think if we get to the point where it becomes a constant issue where we're having to have bylaw come back and deal with this on, then yes, I think I, I, at that time I was planning on coming to council and saying I'd like to, it's not deputize, but you know, a couple of staff to work at that. So I'd like to start with the bylaw enforcement officer. And if it gets to the point where it becomes an issue, then I'll be coming back to you with a report asking to, uh, appoint other staff. Now, uh, is this going to be a complaint driven uh, bylaw um, in order for somebody to get somebody out? The reason I'm asking is that people live in remote areas and there's people, uh, you know, breaking these bylaws, parking in places they shouldn't be. How do we get somebody up there uh, on a weekend, say? Yep. So that's, it would be, it would be, they'd have to complain. I mean, we're, we're typically not at Norcan Lake on a Saturday afternoon, right? So if there's an issue up there, they'll have to, we'll put a blurb on our website. If it's, you know, similar, we have noise and we have other bylaws, call our bylaw enforcement officer and then she can deal with that directly. Okay. Now the bylaw officer gets there. What happens if the vehicle's moved or gone? <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> I don't know. Awesome. But I mean, you know, you, we we hear from lake associations, and especially at boat launches and people parking on the access roads, and they're not overly wide. And we hear all kinds of anecdotal evidence about fire trucks couldn't get down, ambulances couldn't get down. What 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 do we do if people aren't there? They've left the vehicles, so we stick up some parking signs, and we can't enforce them. This will allow us to enforce them. So hopefully, the idea is that some of these some of the vehicles would be ticketed. And then the message starts to spread, you know, don't mess with the sign, so to speak. I, I agree with this bylaw. I think it's something that we need uh, and for those purposes as well. I, I, I kind of like the way it was laid out because, you know, if, if we tow the vehicle, you're not in a municipality where you have access to mass transit or a taxi or whatever, someone's stuck in the boondocks and they can't get out, then what if something happens to them, then what do you do? You know, I don't want to be on the wrong side of that lawsuit. Thank you very much. So, any other comments? Deputy Mayor. Uh, can I comment on a couple of detailed items in here that I, I think are overly stringent? Uh, items three, four, and 10. Three is parking within three meters of a public or, right, that's 10 feet. Uh, normally you can, I'm on page uh, 109. Parking within three meters of a public or private driveway. That, that's within 10 feet of the edge of the driveway. That seems too stringent. I think we can be closer than that. Uh, parking within nine, nine meters of any intersection. I don't think that's enforced in cities. Uh, I think you can generally park within 15 feet of an intersection. Uh, and item 10. Parking on any highway from November 15th to April 15th. Um, we don't have any highways. Yes, we do. Which one? 509, 506. They're not provincial highways. Um, just uh, okay. go for it. 
So that's because of winter maintenance, Deputy Mary. So we, we can't I understand. I I mean. We've had that issue quite a bit. That's the problem is we try to go and plow and cars are in the way and it's kind of, so that's kind of a, that, that one's been in place for forever, right? So we've actually changed it quite a bit. We've loosened it up quite a bit compared to what it was, but this part with the winter maintenance is quite important for us. Well, that means that uh, in the future with the ARIS program in place, uh, you can drive by, see a car parked on November the 16th. There's no snow. Um, you can find that person $200 uh, for, for, okay. I just think that's unreasonable. <laughs> well, should the wording of that not be changed since we have no highways? Because <laughs> you can't enforce that. Uh, just to... So the definition of highway does include all township roads. Um, so we're using the definition out of the municipal act. So it would be all township roads and um, Highway 41, where it does go into our township. So the question is, what happens if your car breaks down and you pull it off to the side? And you have to, it's parked to the side. And it takes time to get a tow truck there. It could be a day sometimes. And that's where we're going to use some discretion. I mean, if you get a car, you know, and go and your car broke down. No problem. Have a good day. Okay. Remember, remember the Councillor Fowler. The roads are considered highways. All the all the roads within the township, other than maybe a private lane, would be considered part of the highway. So I'd like to look at questions or points nineteen and twenty. What's the difference between the two of them? That's designated accessible parking space when a property marked sign is displayed unless a valid accessible parking permit is displayed. And then the other one seems to be the same. Am I wrong? Could be. Oh, I'm in 19 and 20. So here. Oh, shucks. So there's 19. And then you go to the other one. That's got you can park at a at a designated place if you have a, a um, handicap sticker. If you don't, and it's got parking in a designated accessible parking space when a properly marked sign is displayed at any time. So that means if you don't, if you park in the wrong spot, you don't have a handicap pass in your car, you're going to nail three hundred. I don't see the difference between the between the wording of those two, other than nineteen is longer. So the difference there is we had to separate out uh, vehicles from uh, boats and trailers. In 7A, we're saying no person shall park or cost you park any vehicle in a designated accessible parking space. And that fine reflects that. That's number 19. And then in B, no person shall park or cost you parked any boat, trailer, or object in a designated accessible parking space. So we're trying to deal with the difference between a vehicle in a park accessible parking space and someone who parks a trailer or something at a boat launch in an accessible parking space because they don't have a permit, right? So theoretically, they, <laughs> could, they could get fined twice and they have to pick up there with a boat behind them. I, I don't think that would be the okay, case. I'm, I'm I think it's thinking... just if you left your boat and didn't leave. Okay. Didn't leave. Okay. All right. So this is just a summary of, of, of what you pulled out. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Councillor Fowler? Just regarding... Um, private lanes, uh, uh, can we do anything with that, with this bylaw, or is that something the OPP would have to do on the private property? 
Yeah, I don't think this this doesn't apply to private lanes, Councillor Fowler. For a bit more for clarification, private lanes are private property. They're actually owned by someone, and so we can't do we can't regulate them in any way. So, um, give you an example: Norcan uh, Lake Lane is a is a township road, and Heron Way. Is that a township road? It is not. That, that's, and Carson Trail, we had that come up a little while ago. That's a township road. Mm -hmm. And so the, you can put the signage there. Yep. So anything that's privately owned. So we do have some ones that are called lanes, like their name is Lane, like Norcan Lake Lane, um, which is actually a township road. Um, so if it's a township road, regardless of how it's named, then we can we can put regulations on it. But if it's a private lane, which is privately owned, we can't regulate those. Corey? So did you still want us to look at, uh, you had a couple of concerns, Deputy Mayor. We can look at that if you'd like us to. I don't, I'm not, I don't wanna kind of go past your concerns. So if you want us to look at that, we can or remove. Again, this is, uh, if you have changes you'd like, let us know so we can make them. Deputy Mayor. Um, well, it seems to me the process here is that you have to get this whole schedule of fines approved by um, the regional senior justice. So maybe you should do that first. And there may be an objection from that source and then we can fine tune it from there. Yeah, I, I think once we get those, once we get those set by the justice, it's gonna be pretty hard to make those changes. So, I mean, that's uh, the, these that we used, actually we've taken from a lot of, uh, we've explored quite a few other bylaws as well. Um, so, so we haven't we haven't uh, kind of made any of these up, but most of them are all kind of what we've looked to see what other communities are size are doing. So they're kind of, but yeah, I think yeah, if you want to do this, this is the time to to do this because once we go to that, it's hard to make those changes. So you're saying that other small rural municipalities have very similar parking. We won't be alone out in left field imposing these. No, we actually consulted really closely with Greater Madawaska as well mm -hmm. on this. So, and they're very similar. So they've, uh, this has become quite a source of revenue for, for the, we're not anticipating that here, but it's become a real source of revenue for Greater Madawaska. Mm -hmm. So again, we're, we're not looking for that. We're hoping it doesn't because that's not what we're looking for, but, but yeah. Well, I won't, I, I just made the comments. I'm not okay. going to require any or ask for any changes. Are there any final comments? In favor of the resolution? Carried. Mayor Lichty? Did we? It's me, Corey. Oh, hi. Is it okay if Don was uh, excused oh, for not reading? Going. Yeah, sure. Have a good night, Don. Thank you for your time. Same for you, Dimitri, if you want to leave. Okay. Okay, so we're now looking at the reports from the missile managers, clerks, and treasurers. Moved by Councillor Regent, seconded by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the clerk planning manager's administrative report entitled Association of Municipal Managers, Clerk and Treasurers Conference, June 11th to 14th, 2023. Any, com any comments? Uh, I think Tara's report is absolutely excellent. And if you look, if you go into it, there's four examples of real situations that we should be, you know, we should be aware of. I forget what they are right now, but I thought they were good and I got to draw your attention to them. And if you haven't read them, maybe you should go back and take a look. So in favor? Carried. Also good. Yes, can we uh, jump ahead so that uh, Dimitri and, and Nick can uh, leave if they want? This is the last two, two items, on. then they can leave and then... Okay. Okay. Yes, we'll get. We'll make sure we won't go into the other part. Yeah. Um, so now we're looking at the OCA conference. Moved by Councillor Regent, seconded by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the administrative report entitled Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustments Conference from Gary Wood and Jim Ogilvie, Committee of Adjustment members. Any comments? In favor? Motions carried. Move, but sorry. Treasurer. 
Moved by Councillor Regent, second by Councillor Good. Be resolved that Council receives for information the Treasurer's Administrative Report entitled AMCTO Conference, June 11th to 14th, 2023. Any comments? In favor? Carried. Okay, let's do that. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent, be resolved that Council amends the agenda to consider item 15 at this time. Any comments? In favor? Carried. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent, be it resolved that leave be given to the movement or introduce the following bylaws that have been circulated to all members of Council. Bylaw 4923, road renaming bylaw, Leswick Lane, amend bylaw 0703. Bylaw 5023, Shore Road closing bylaw, Wickman, McDonald, Unger, Bellstone, and Ritico Atwood. Bylaw 5123, to regulate parking of vehicles, boats, and trailers. 5223, to amend fees and charges bylaw, 5323, zoning bylaw amendment, Jewel Road, and bylaw 5423, building bylaw and repeal bylaw 3821, and that these bylaws be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Any comments? In favor? Motions carried. Start. Drive safe, gentlemen. Okay, so we're up to the communications during non-business hours. Moved by Councillor Regent, second by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the Chief Administrative Officer's Administrative Report entitled Council and Staff Communications During Non-Business Hours. Any comments on this, Councillor Hoodle? So first, uh, thanks, Corey, for doing that report. Um, I am a little disappointed in OPG's response, though, at the end. I know um, you didn't contact them, but uh, the Chief did. Um, what they consider an emergency and what affects people may be two different things. Were they? I just want to know if they were made aware of the situation and how it affected a, a large group of residents on, on that river. I didn't bring Eric's email with me, but I, I, I feel like they were, but I will look into that and I'll get back to you on that. I'll have to review Eric's email to them. I, I think so, but I'll have to look into that. And, and then, and then on, the, on, on the flip side, we now have their contact. So if they're not going to call us, we have their contact in that emergency procedure. Is that correct? Yep, the the person that responded advice, he's in he's in charge of that. Okay. Of that scenario. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? The Corey, the uh, proposal that you got here 
keeps you front and center. I know we're small. I know we don't have a lot of management depth and so on, but I would like to see you think about somehow maybe delegating some of the off hours authority to your other managers, you know, so everybody takes a turn or something, it's something for you to think about. I'm not, I'm going to vote in favor of this. I'm just trying to lighten your workload a little. So, and I know you have a different way of yeah. doing business. I know you do, and mine was different. So go ahead. No, I totally agree with you, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's, yeah, I think, you know, even some type of on-call system that would be compensated, I would be in favor of that. So just something for you to think about. I'm going to vote in favor of this, but it's something we can, should look at. I'm concerned about your workload and your time off. Hey, I really don't hear from you guys much. <laughs> like, well, when you do, <laughs> it's fine. It's so kind really, of a I, sword coming I, I haven't had any. Con personally, I'm having concerns. You guys, really, again, these are good. So, I mean, I'm. If it was something that every weekend and it was crazy, so you know, I could, I could, yeah. I, I mean, I'll keep an eye over that. But again, it's not really. There's not a huge impact to me at this stage. But okay. thank you, thank you for thinking of me. That's great. Any other comments? In favor of the motion. Motion's carried. External committees, committee of uh, adjustment minutes. Moved by Councillor Regent, second by Councillor Good. Be it resolved that Council receives for information the minutes of a meeting of the Committee of Adjustment Planning Advisory Committee dated June 26, 2023. Comments? In favor? Carried. Item 11B, Economic Development Task Force. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Council Councillor Regent. Be resolved that Council receives for information the July 17th, 2023 notes of the Economic Development Task Force. Comments? In favor? Motions carried. Item 12, any notice of motion? Seeing none. Uh, we have no motions, written notice, et cetera. Councillor Council of Verbal Reports. Okay, so as the mayor, I have been to uh, Sunday Lake um, Lake Association meetings, AGM, Buckshot Lake, AGM, uh, West Big Gull Lake, uh, the Lions Club fundraiser for a um, hole building generator for the Lions Club facility in Northbrook. They opened the um, um, golf tournament and I've been to a number of private individuals homes and so on by request and I'm meeting with um, the North Frontenac Lake Association Alliance this Saturday Councillor Good Councillor Good Venus sorry Yes, I haven't attended any other ones besides uh, uh, at Shabamika Lake. And as far as roads, I've been working on all inspections, lots of them. Notice that. Councillor Regent. So I attended the Big Gull Lake Association meeting uh, with the mayor. That was excellent. The feedback has been very, very good. And September 11th is my next meeting with the family health team. Okay. Councilor Hoodle. Uh, there's no uh, MVCA board meeting this month. Um, I was at the Buckshot Lake Association meeting, being the president of the Lake Association. Um, and I'm going to the Big Gull Lake meeting next week, the other side of Big Gull Lake in War II. Uh, and I will also be at the NFLAA meeting on Saturday. Are you going to be at that meeting as a representative of Buckshot Lake or as a counselor? I'll bring both hats. Okay. But mostly as a president of the Lake Association. Okay. So, Councillor Fowler. Yes. Um, as far as the EOTA, we'll have a, uh, they've been off uh, this month. No meetings. Uh, next meeting is September 14th. And same with the SALT committee, the uh, September 7th is their next meeting. Um, 
we did have a county planning and development uh, meeting yesterday, uh, discussions regarding the KMP trail and maintenance and who will, who will be in charge of it once it's completed. Um, and also there is a discussion regarding the physician recruitment. And also they're talking about hiring a tourism representative. So it would be a, a working under the planning and development committee. So was that in a closed meeting or was that open to the public? It was It was an open meeting. Okay. Sorry, I should have asked that before. Um, um, and I did attend um, uh, on the 22nd of July, the Palmerston Lake Association AGM. Yeah. Councillor Inglis. Um, the only one I have to report on is the meeting that occurred the day after Fred's meeting, which was the Conanto Lake Property Owners Association. So both lakes got represented by Ward 3 councillors. Good. Um, <laughs> They uh, they don't have any particular concerns that I can remember. I miss Councillor Hermer. I apologize. I'm following this list, list so I get it right. <laughs> I have nothing to report, except I didn't receive a, an invitation for Buckshot Lake from Councillor Hudel. Okay. that you guys to sort out with. And that's supposed to be two counselors. So everybody knows what's going on. Okay. Um, okay. So that brings us to the public forum. Is there any comments? Anybody online? Mr. Kent? If anyone online wishes to make comment, uh, please use the raise hand feature. None noted. So that brings us to the point in our uh, public meeting, our regular meeting, where we have to go into a closed session. So that means we let's take five minutes till quarter to seven, and we will clear the council chamber. I have to do the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Are you you're Kelly, still recording? Put it back on. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent. Be a result that Council retires to closed session at 6.38 p.m. to adopt closed minutes dated June 20th, 2023 and June 29th, 2023 and personnel and audit committee meeting dated July 11th, 2023. And Councillor, to consider advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, specifically with regards to an update from the public works manager and a confidential complaint, and to consider a request under the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. In favor? Carry. Okay, 7.15, we're back at it. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are returning to the regular meeting. So, what do I have to read here? Rise and report. Okay. So, you have it written? So, okay. Go ahead with what we did and then I'll be here. Yeah, I'm just going to let, let you do it, and then the next time I'll get it. So during uh, closed session, uh, council approved uh, minutes from council and the uh, personnel and audit committee. Um, they dealt with a request under MFEPA, and they dealt with an another matter and have a motion for open session. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent, be it resolved that Council discuss the Hills Lake culvert in closed session today, and the Council instructs the Public Works Manager to issue a written notice of two property owners on Hills Lake, advising Council approves proceeding with the alternate culvert design with a technical review and design at an estimated $15,000, and that the Public Works Manager will attempt to provide drainage and make temporary repairs to the adjacent entrance until the new culvert is installed. 
In favor? Carried. So adjournment of council. Oh, sorry. Ah, you're in open, so be careful. Yeah, I, I was good. I know. We'll start it out when I was sitting here. No, we got that. M. Pfeffer? Um, so the confirming bylaw 5523. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent, be resolved that bylaw 5523 being a bylaw to confirm all actions and proceedings of Council for its regular meeting held August 17th, 2023, be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. In favor? Gary. Adjournment of Council. Moved by Councillor Good, second by Councillor Regent, be resolved that Council adjourns the meeting at 7.13 p.m. until September 7th, 2023, sorry, until September 6th, 2023, or at the call of the chair. In favor? Carried. Drive safe, ladies and gentlemen.